Good morning, First Baptist Church. It's good to see you on this uh, second lesson in our midweek Bible study, which is simply how to study your Bible. You know, I've always wanted to do this study on the internet uh, and uh, for you. I've done it a, quite a few times over the past few years here at First Baptist Church, and I keep doing it because I, am key, I keep wanting to encourage you to study your Bible, to learn your Bible, to read it, and to read it with some intentionality. So by the time you finish reading it in a sitting, you're not asking, what did I just read and why does this matter? So this uh, last week's lesson, if you caught it, uh, was on get to know your Bible and really to just look through your Bible, get to know it. What are the little notes for? If you have a study Bible, what, what does the study Bible have to add to your time of reading God's word? How does the translation affect your reading of God's word? This lesson is on what we bring to the text. You know, whenever we come to uh, into a relationship, we bring our understanding and, and all of the baggage that we have into that relationship. And our relationship to God's word is no different. When we come to the Bible, we bring a lot of things with us. We bring our background, we bring our biases, we bring our uh, religious traditions and our understanding of the Bible, our uh, we bring our uh, opinions and griefs and uh, celebrations. Our understanding of God shapes how we read the Bible. Um, and uh, again, you know, so many times when we have debates about the Bible, we're really not debating the text. We're debating our various backgrounds and what we bring to the text. Uh, God's word, some people say God's word is very clear and, 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 it, and it says we should read it and simply listen to what it says. And that's not always the case. You know, God's word is very confusing. There are a lot of times when we need help or resources on understanding the Bible. But we can't understand the Bible on its own terms if we don't understand ourselves and what we bring to the Bible. You know, consider marriage. Uh, I got married when I was very young. I was uh, 20 when I got engaged to Christina. And uh, both of us were 20 and, and we got married when we were 21. We said those vows that we would love each other till death do us part, but it, it has taken a, a, this many years, 20 some odd years, to understand each other. And a lot of our conflicts, a lot of our time together, and a lot of our joys together and successes have not only to do with how we have related to each other, but what we bring into the relationship. So today, I want you to consider your understanding of what you bring to the text and how who you are might shape your reading of God's word and your understanding of God's word. So the first thing we have to ask is, what's the difference between reading the Bible and interpreting the Bible? You can just read the Bible and read it, but when you make sense of it, when you interpret it, when you seek to understand it, a lot of all of the things that are already in your head, again, that cultural background, that uh, church upbringing, uh, your own understanding of the world around you, comes to bear an interpretation. Uh, and there are really uh, three ways to, to read the text. Uh, first is, is just for informational. You can read the Bible as if it's a newspaper and just read it. Okay, facts, figures, uh, it gives you some admonitions, affirmations, challenges. It tells you about sin or what's not sin, and that's just information. But then the, the next way is for inspiration. You read it and you're inspired and you look at it. But then the third way of reading the Bible is for formation. Uh, when we read the Bible formationally, we're allowing God to meet us in his word, uh, bring, coming to bear in that relationship with scripture, and bringing what we bear to that relationship as well as what the Bible brings, and figuring out where God is trying to shape us and form us and where the Holy Spirit is at work in us to bring not only meaning to God's word, but to also influence our life to be more godly, to be more holy, and to be guided by the mandates and the message of God's word uh, and um, how it relates to our life and our church. Um, I read somewhere just today, let me get it, uh, in this book I've been reading, it's called The Strange Silence of the of the Bible in the church, and uh, this uh, author, James Smart, uh, says this. Let me grab it for you here. The Bible is marching orders for an army, 
not bedtime reading, to help one sleep more soundly. Uh, and then he goes on to say, um, the Bible is a book to be studied by the Christian community. Uh, not to make it primarily devotional literature for private use, but rather uh, to allow it to speak not only to us, but to how we live in the world and live in our uh, day and age. Uh, it goes on to say some other profound things, but we'll, we'll skip it. But um, it does stress the need that when we uh, read the Bible formationally, we believe that the Holy Spirit is conforming us to the image of Christ and that God's word uh, inspires that, even if it makes us uh, repent or challenges us or brings us to a place of understanding. Uh, so one of the, the, the first things to do, we're going to, uh, let's see, approach uh, two different um, uh, or, or ask several different questions. And the first thing to, to really understand uh, that what, of what you bring to the text is to ask first, what is your background? Uh, how does your background, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what is your upbringing? Background is number two. What is your upbringing? Um, so, so consider your upbringing, you know, um, if you were brought up in the South, uh, versus say the North, you may have two very different views of <clears throat> worldviews or views of approaching the Bible. <clears throat> so my upbringing was in a evangelical church in a Christian, uh, Italian family in the North. Um, every, <clears throat> every Sunday, my family would gather around the table to eat and to feast and and there was it was a, a household filled with love and it wasn't just my immediate family it was all of my cousins and my uncles and aunts who would get together uh and within that family i felt very nurtured very safe and protected and i felt very included uh so when i grew up i, I realized that this idea of inclusion of fellowship of love of being family uh, applied very well to when I read the Bible. When I read the Bible, I feel that Jesus is including me, that I'm a part of God's family. And I bring that upbringing and I bring those values to bear when I read the Bible. It helps shape my, my upbringing. But then on the other hand, being an Italian uh, from the North, there were some things that I, that I recognized in me that didn't resonate in the Bible. You know, I come, I'm an Italian. I'm a New Yorker. And, uh, you know, some of that comes with some attitude. So when I come to the Bible... I can see that the scriptures is pushing against some of those those things that my upbringing has affected. You know, um, if my upbringing makes me get my own way or makes me more aggressive or assertive as, as a as a New York Italian, whereas the Bible, you know, Jesus says, "Blessed are the meek." Uh, it, it it confronts those things in me. But if I don't recognize that about my upbringing of what I bring to the text, then I assume that the Bible merely affirms everything about me. You know, oh, I'm good, I'm okay, I don't need to change anything about myself. Uh, and the Bible, I just read it, you know, and, and it really doesn't apply to my life. No. Your upbringing shapes how you approach the Bible, but it also shapes the word and the conversation that, that needs to take place between uh, you and God. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, because the, the Bible not only affirms, it also disturbs. It, it, dis, it brings disorientation because the Lord wants to move us to a place in which we are one and in partnership with him through the Holy Spirit. Uh, so what is your upbringing? What do you bring to the text? Uh, you know, we talk about our families, our, our heritage. Some of those values, however, might conflict with the Bible. And rather than making the Bible say what we want it to say, we really need to let the Bible speak to our values so that we may have to jettison some values or conform our values and our, our moral understanding of the world to, to Scripture. And that's very, very difficult. Uh, so what's your upbringing? What do you bring to the text uh, in your upbringing? Um, understand your background, um, your religious background. Uh, you know, just because your Sunday school teacher taught you something about the Bible doesn't necessarily make it true. You know, I, I've run into that so many times where um, I've, I've taught the Bible and people have come up to me and said, Joe, I've never heard that about that scripture. And I say, oh, well, thank you. You know, that's really meaningful. I'm glad you, you got something new out of it. And they say, no, no, I never heard that. Uh, and I don't think you're correct. I was like, well, just because you never heard it doesn't mean it's not true. And just because your Sunday school t teacher taught it to you when you were six 
still doesn't make it true. It may be correct in its basic basics, but when you read the Bible, you know, there there's more understanding. We have to evolve. We have to grow. We have to um, uh, go deeper in the word than just to, to bring a naivete, uh, an adolescent faith to bear on a Bible that... Uh, uh, under the authority of a Lord and a Holy Spirit that seeks to mature us as Christians, uh, that seeks to allow us to bear fruit, one of which is to, to grow in knowledge um, and to, uh, to bring to bear the Word of God to, to mature us and bring us to a deeper faith. So we have to consider our church backgrounds. Uh, I remember, um, you know, people saying, well, I don't see that in the Bible, you know, or... And I said, well, you know, Christmas trees aren't in the Bible either. Um, you know, but we, you know, how does that ritual of having a Christmas tree inform a Christmas? You know, um, how, how does our, um, our religious rituals and upbringing about our ideas of worship, how does that inform our reading of Scripture? Um, uh, I, I, as a recent example, you know, I heard someone say justice is, you know, the word justice is a political word. It's it's used in politics, and you know it, it's. And I said, justice is in the Bible. Justice is a biblical word. Just because you made it political, doesn't mean that you have a clear understanding uh, that it's not in the Bible, and uh, and that you um, interpret it a certain way. When the Bible has the word justice all over, all over, just read the prophets, and um, and and Jesus' own, you know, bring to bear. Uh, so, so your your religious upbringing, your political upbringing, uh, your cultural upbringing can really shape how you read the Bible. Um, you know, people in China who have a, a more group culture than our more individualistic culture read the Bible very differently than we do. Uh, people who are persecuted, like for reals persecuted, uh, where they have underground churches, they that that brings a different ethic to bear. When, when that kind of people read the Bible compared to us. Uh, and so when we talk about religious upbringing and background, and um, uh, we, we talk about things like culture, we talk about things like our education, uh, people who work on the farm um, may have a different understanding of the Bible or, or, or read the Bible differently than, say, someone who uh, goes to work on Wall Street. Um, uh, we, we look at our family, our understanding of family, and we look at our church traditions. Um, you know, I'm a Baptist through and through, but um, but I also, my, my, my background, my church upbringing is also in uh, charismatic evangelicalism. So, um, so I have a bit of a charismatic streak in me. Um, that shapes how I read the Bible, uh, devotionally at least. Uh, and how I go about uh, a worship. Uh, you know, I don't speak in tongues or anything, um, but I'm not afraid of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Um, and, um, you know, so that, that plays a part. Um, if, you know, my background, for instance, um, being raised um, in that kind of, of evangelicalism, you know, when I became a Baptist and was ordained into the Baptist church and got... Uh, educated in a Baptist seminary, there were a lot of things that, that I wasn't raised with. I saw a lot of my friends who were raised in the Baptist church who, who knew how to do Baptist life, and it was foreign to me. And when I read the Bible, I read it a little bit differently than, than those who had grown up in Baptist life. Um, so uh, what about you? When you read the Bible, when you read, um, uh, what, what do you bring to the text? Uh, by the way, you know, most the most basic question that people ask is, where do I start reading the Bible? And I say start with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Most likely you should start with, like, Matthew, because it has Jesus' teachings. It's first in the four Gospels, and Jesus uh, emphasizes his teachings in that Gospel. And it's hard to walk away from the Gospel of Matthew without knowing what Jesus really wants from us. Uh, so if you want to study the Bible, start with the, the Gospel of Matthew, and then as you're reading it, ask, what is Jesus asking of me? But then what do I bring to the text? What does my value say? What does my background say? And if those things conflict, you got to pray through it. you got to let the Holy Spirit shape you and form you and uh, bring conviction to your life. You may need to repent from, from a few things and turn towards God. 
uh, or God may encourage you and comfort you uh, through his word. Uh, the Bible promises both comfort and distress when you, when you read it. Challenge, comfort and challenge. Uh, the next, so understand your upbringing, you know, what do you have to bear on, on the Bible? And, um, the next is what is your background? And then the last question is what is your bias? Um, we all read the Bible through a certain lens, through certain, a, a certain bias. And when we make the Bible say what we want it to say, and then we tell other people they're wrong, sometimes they are wrong, but nine out of 10 times, we read the Bible through our biases, and then we think that our biases uh, are really what the Bible says, and that's not the case. The Bible is a very complex book written over thousands of years by, uh, by lots of authors, put together by lots of editors, and then put together over time into what we know as the canon. And when we read the book, we confront a culture and a people, words, uh, and, uh, and a background and culture very different from our own. So for us to impose our bias on the text, not only shortchanges God's word, it also makes us uh, the, the, um, the, uh, judi uh, the, the people who uh, adjudicate uh, or how to apply God's word. Um, this is why back in the day, Baptists in the South believed that slavery was biblical. They had a bias. They had an economic, um, they had an economic stake in slavery. And it wasn't just economics, it was a theological understanding that black people were inherently not human. So you can't argue with somebody who believes in slavery, not because of economic means, but because they believe because based on theology that came out of Europe, that black people are not human, they're property. Whereas in the North and abolitionists had the bias that yes, black people are made in the image of God. And uh, because of that, there's only one Adam and one Eve from whence, from when, whence all of us come, because of that we should all be treated equally. The problem with that is that the Baptists in the South were arguing that the Bible also says, slaves, obey your masters. And the people in the North were saying, yeah, but Genesis says we're all made in God's image and that no one is property to another. Both argue out of a place of moral justification, but both are biased and made God's word to say what they wanted it to say in order to push their own agenda. What bias do you bring to the text? And a lot of your bias may be based on your background and your upbringing. And because of that, again, that's why it's so important for us to think about what we bring to this relationship with God's word. What do we bring in this conversation? And too often we're so busy reading the text without stopping to think about it. And when we pray, we do all the talking that we never let the Holy Spirit enter into that relationship in order to change us or to bring us to new understanding. And unfortunately, sometimes people get hurt. Churches split. Because people don't seek understanding together in God's word, but rather stake their flag in a certain part of the Bible and argue uh, from that place of moral justification to the point where they create division rather than a culture of discernment in which we all come together as diverse as we are into God's, into Christ's church as Christ's body in order to read God's word together and wrestle with it together get to some places where we understand it, get to some places where maybe it's still ambiguous, but we understand from different points of view, or in some cases come to the Bible and just say, I don't know what this says and I'm not sure how this applies, but we'll do it at least. Uh, if, we, if we're in that place of certainty or uncertainty or ambiguity, or that place of an unresolved uh, understanding of the Bible, at least we'll be together. So that's, uh, that does it for this lesson on uh, how to study your Bible. Again, the first lesson was get to know your Bible. This lesson was get to know yourself. Make sure you like and subscribe and uh, tune in, email, post, a comment. Let us know uh, uh, how we can uh, continue this conversation. I'll see you next week.